Praise be Jesus Christ. The gospel for this first Sunday of Lent launches us into the desert with Jesus. We see our blessed Lord doing combat with the devil. And here this shines light on our own spiritual battles. The only, the war in Ukraine is not the only war going on. We all, we all experience spiritual warfare. The battle begins in the mind on, on what happens in our thought patterns, our, thought, our thinking processes. This is where temptation can present itself and plant the seeds of suggestion that can lead us in the wrong direction. What can we learn from the story of our blessed Lord in the desert to help us in our own tests and to allow the Lord to bring forth from our tests new testimony of his strength, his grace being operative in each of our lives. We know that the devil's favorite weapon is discouragement and his primary target is our weaknesses, specifically our wounds. Behind every sin, there is a wound, a wound in human nature or an emotional wound from which the vice lodges itself. And the enemy always tries to attack us when we are most vulnerable. In most 12-step programs, there's an acronym called HALT, H-A-L-T. Whenever we are hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, we need a halt. We need to pump the brakes and start to slow down before we crash. Because it is when we're in a vulnerable state that we are oftentimes attacked. So we have to be careful. We see Jesus today in the, in the gospel while in the desert fasting for 40 days, he was hungry. And that what seems like an odd detail to the story expresses that Jesus entered into all the vulnerability of our human condition. That God, who is in need of, un of nothing outside of himself, by taking on our human condition, experienced all the fragility of our life and became in need. The hunger in the acronym HALT isn't something as simple as hungry for food, but hungry for attention. Hungry for validation. Hungry for any illicit pleasure that would in any way undermine our true purpose for happiness. Whenever a person is feeling needy, this can be that kind of vulnerable hunger that can be an opportunity for the enemy to offer a counterfeit solution to the need that is at hand. How does temptation present itself? Very subtly in the thoughts. And in the beginning of the temptation, the enemy will often suggest whatever he is proposing as if it's no big deal, as if there's nothing wrong with it. It's Everybody's doing it. And he makes it seem so sugar-coated and attractive that he coerces, he coaxes, he soothes the person, he allures the soul into the snare. And once the person has given the consent to whatever has been tempting him or her, then oftentimes the enemy will change his approach and he'll become the, not no longer the seducer, but the accuser. And he begins to bombard and assault and oppress the person with feeling utterly miserable about themselves and make them even hate themselves for what they have done. 
the very thing that often he had so much coaxed and coerced. But it's ultimately the person that, that makes the consent, that makes the choice. What is, what are the varying degrees between the temptation and the thoughts and the choice of the heart for which we are culpable, when which we become responsible? Because Jesus became like us in all things except sin. We know that. And yet he was tempted. None of us are immune to temptation. Every single one of us will be tempted until the day of our last breath, to the day of our death and the moment of our last breath. We're all vulnerable to temptation and to attack. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And so we have the spirit of the living God to be able to discern, to clothe ourselves in God's armor and to quench the fiery arrows, the missiles of the enemy, as Ephesians chapter 6 speaks about. So let's take a look deeper at the details of this, this psychology of temptation, how it works in our thought life. As I mentioned before, the temptation will come in the form of a suggestion and a thought, idea, a memory, an imagining, a fantasy, a projection. And because our minds are often flowing in a stream of consciousness, there's always a thought pattern process taking place or an inner monologue in the mind, in the thought life. And so our thoughts can be pondering something neutral, amoral, neither good nor evil, and then all of a sudden, within a matter of seconds, go from A to Z and find itself in a place uh, of entertaining perhaps an illicit pleasure, something sinful, something that one in one's right mind would never want to voluntarily do. And as that temptation presents itself, it's trying to get from the level of the thought life to entertainment and to the into the level of the deeper layers of the heart. And so once we notice and we become aware of what we're thinking, we we come to a place of having to make a decision whether or not to allow that to linger, to add fuel to the flame, to entertain or to resist and to renounce. Because at the point of awareness, when I become aware that I've been pondering on something that isn't good, then once I become aware of that, even though I may have been thinking about it, say for 10 seconds on automatic pilot, once I become aware is when now comes the moment of decision, which if I continue to go that, that route, can become a consent to sin. But if I renounce it right away, when I notice the weed, I destroy the weed while it's still a seed. And I can pray something as simple as in Jesus' name, I renounce this thought. In Jesus' name, I reject this idea, be gone. In Jesus' name, I renounce the spirit behind this temptation, behind this vice, be gone. We set a boundary in our thought life. Just as you would in an unhealthy relationship, so you're not taking advantage of. So to the thought life, you set a boundary and you say no to a particular thought pattern and process. Destroy the weed while it's still a seed. Because if we don't, that weed will become stronger Will, be, will begin to root itself and will be harder to unpluck. It'll, the longer it stays, the more it is compromised and it is allowed to live and to be thought about, the harder it will be to remove. Now, why is it then that sometimes certain thoughts certain suggestions that, are, that have a, a, a quality of temptation to them 
might not leave right away. They might come back like a mosquito, just you, you brush it off and then a few seconds later it comes back or a few minutes later it's there buzzing in your ear again. In being decisive, we have to say no with all of our will, with all of our self. And because our humanity is a mix of flesh and spirit, we experience within us this combat of two contradictory opposites between flesh and spirit. An ego-centered life and a God-centered life. Things that draw us to the thing, to what is of the Lord and the things that draw us to the way of the world. Things that are a reflection of our true self and God's image and likeness and things that are a reflection in us or an inclination towards our false self in the world's image and likeness. And when a temptation presents itself, if only 70% of me, my better true self, says no to the idea, and if there's a lingering uh, curiosity or interest, and, and part of my person is still enticed by the prospect of what's being presented, then I will not have the tenacity of spirit through grace to cast it out. It's only when all of me is saying to the vice, to the sin and the spirit, no, get out, that it will go. And the sooner we do that, the better off we are. So it doesn't become stronger. It doesn't, it doesn't progress from being a toehold to a foothold to a stronghold. From being a, an occasion and a cause of oppression to obsession and ultimately to possession in the sense of the vice taking possession of the person where a person becomes enslaved or addicted to the vice and the spirit of it.